everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptocurrent. Your host here, Richard Carthon. And today I have a special guest that just dropped a really cool book that I'm excited to learn more about. And hopefully all of you will go and pick up after we have the writer, the amazing Brett King, who just wrote The Rise of Techno Socialism. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Richard. Thanks for having me on. Is it Richard or Rich? Either. Either works. Either. Yeah, because Australians, we tend to either shorten the name or lengthen it. That's the thing we do, right? But <laughs> yeah, man, like aluminium. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but man, it's it's awesome to have you on the show. Thanks so much for, Thank for uh, stopping by. But first, I just want to learn a little bit more about you. Can you just give us a little bit of background on yourself? Sure. I started life, uh, you know, in my career as a bite ripper, as a coder many moons ago, but found that I had this ability to communicate between business people and technologists that was fairly unique. So sort of carved out a, a career in that. Worked a lot in um, sort of technology infrastructure in the utility space and financial services, um, but sort of worked through um, a lot of the banking and, and financial services space through the noughties with the emergence of crypto and, and all of those things. Um, and then 2010, I wrote my first book, which is called Bank 2.0. And this is my sixth book I'm coming up to now. Um, and, you know, just basically wrote about technology disruption, disruption of the finance industry and banking space. And then I'm a bit of a frustrated sci-fi guy. So 2015, I wrote a book called Augmented, Life in the Smart Lane. And that ended up on the bookshelf of President Xi of China during his national address in 2018. So that was sort of a big deal. But yeah, I've been, I'm really been focused on the banking and financial services space for the last decade or so in terms of technology disruption more broadly. Wow. So very timely in a lot of different facets between different uh, bubbles that I think are in the traditional markets. And then of course, the rise of cryptocurrency and blockchain. So uh, I'm sure it's been a lot of fun on this journey, writing your six different books. Um, but on that note, you know, what was your first introduction into the crypto blockchain in, uh, space in the first place? Um, you know, I, I mean, I think probably around 2008 when, um, you know, the, the uh, Bitcoin white paper released, you know, I, I definitely remember downloading that at some point and going, wow, this is really interesting. Um, you know, uh, I think um, it also paralleled a lot of social media development. So a lot of the crowd that I was involved in that were keen on disrupting the banking sector, they were talking about crypto. But uh, I moved to the US in October of, of 2010, um, not long after my first book came out, and ended up down at Wall Street or FIDI um, with Charlie Schramm and Roger Ver at some Bitcoin meetups uh, in those days. Um, I got connected around that time as well with um, Brock Pierce, who was at the time, you know, um, and some of the, the Bitcoin Foundation guys. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel like I've been plugged in, you know, for, for a long time in that community. I will say that, um, you know, I, I, the, the one rule of hodling your, uh, your, your Bitcoin, I, I cashed out, you know, when it hit, you know, 20K back in uh, whatever it was. And I, you know, I still regret that, yeah, in oh, 2018. Man. But, you know, I could have done a lot better. Um, but, you know, I've still got some crypto, um, obviously. And I, I, I'm very interested in where crypto takes us from here because I think designing currencies for purpose is is going to be a whole new arena. No doubt, man. And having that extensive background, being able to see the, the white paper back in 2008, having that exposure to it, even I'm sure getting in pretty early and cashing out at 20 was still a solid come up. So congrats on that. Um, and the purpose of like hodling and like why sometimes you just need things to develop to see that ROI. Uh, we like to really like, I like to really reaffirm people that things take time. And when you're really trying to disrupt an entire industry, uh, you have to lay down foundations and you have to put things in place for, for things to truly be disrupted. And I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak to this, but I'm sure that's, probably a talking point within your new book. So can you just tell us a little bit about um, your new book that just came out, The Rise of Techno-Socialism. Uh, can you just give us some information on that? Sure. So, um, you know, I the book started in terms of the work that we started doing on it. Uh, Dr. Richard Petty is my co-author on this. He's, you know, basically an economist. Um, but it started with us looking at the problem of inequality. And particularly during the pandemic, how inequality, um, you know, 
worsened significantly in the United States. And then looking at artificial intelligence and climate change and what they're going to do to that same problem. Um, and realizing that capitalism in its current form really doesn't have the tools to address this. So we sort of mapped out what are the possible futures that humanity has? Where are the inflection points in respect to how we adapt to these crises, these rolling crises, pandemic, inequality, AI, and climate? And we came up with a way to sort of map that on a grid. So, you know, inclusive uh, systems versus exclusionary systems, or you might say more focused on collective humanity versus individualism. And the US is very much, uh, you know, focused on individual rights and ownership versus, say, Europe, which is more collective or collectively oriented. And then looking at chaotic futures versus planned or positive futures. So this was the grid we created. And in that, we mapped out four potential futures. And that was uh, Ladistan, where there's a broad rejection of science and technology. So that fits in the inclusive chaotic uh, quadrant. Failedistan, where we just wait too long to address these big problems, like you know the fact that Maldives and Bangladesh are basically going to disappear with sea rise and New York and Miami are going to be underwater. We wait too long and the effects are far worse than they have to be. So that's the chaotic side. Then we have neo-feudalism, which is essentially where the corporations get to set policy and inequality gets baked into these economies on a more permanent basis. Um, and the rich get the best tech. You know, they get to live live uh, longer lives because they got longevity treatments and things like that. Um, but the poor, you know, they're, they're left to their own resources versus where we sort of try and create a more inclusive society where technology works for good for all people and gives us basic access to the sort of basic basic services we need, like healthcare, education, homelessness, and so forth, and how through automation, we can actually pay for all of those things um, at like a much lower cost than what we spend on government today. So um, think of like the US as a DAO. That's effectively what we um, basically uh, um, you know, predict as one of the potential outcomes. So it's sort of a... Um, you know, these four choices where we mapped out. And ultimately, we came to the conclusion that in that upper right corner, the, um, you know, economically right-wing, socially left-wing sort of techno-socialist uh, approach is the optimal path for humanity to take. Very interesting. Wow. So plenty to unpack there. And the place that I want to start is that path to that techno techno-socialist type of, of outset where we are building a technology that is fastly growing and, and is also for the community, for everyone to, to share. I feel like in a lot of ways, innovation is starting to be... Where capitalism is good is that it provides for innovation. It provides for people wanting to go and create the best because they're then rewarded with, with the capital. But on the flip side of it, with doing that, it also takes away from helping the collective. You look at the U.S. healthcare system and how some drugs cost an absorbent amount in the U.S. but don't overseas. So how do you think we continue to go into that idealistic path forward? Well, I think this sort of comes back to a basic question of economics is you know, what's the purpose of an economy? Economists would say, well, you know, there's GDP growth, there's full employment, um, you know, market returns. They use these sort of terms to talk about the performance of, of an economy. But at the heart of it, an economy should meet the needs of its citizens. And if you use the former, you know, those economic uh, metrics, then the, the post-Second World War economy of the United States is the most successful economy we've ever seen in human history. But if you use the latter, that the economy serves the citizens, then you could argue that your US economy is a failure um, because of the gap. You know, the top 1% of Americans own more than the bottom 90% of Americans today. So that's not, that's, that's not a situation that can continue to exist. Capitalism works very well, but one of the things it does is it creates competition. Um, and one of the things that we, we do as a result of the application of technology is we apply that to create more productive companies. And so nine of the top 
10 companies in the world today are technology companies as a result of capitalism. But those companies employ far less humans than companies of the 1950s and 1960s used to because we had a lot more manual labor involved in that process. So if you extend that analogy out another 20 or 30 years with artificial intelligence, the workforce is going to be very small, but they're going to have these massively profitable companies. Um, and so in highly automated societies, we expect technology unemployment. Um, and, you know, we have to figure out a way to address that rather than saying you just got to work harder or you've got to get a better education. Because ultimately, none of that will, you know, will provide you with a job because we're we're actively trying to take humans out of the workforce with technology. So we need a, a different economic paradigm. How, you know, we it's no longer going to be your sole value in society is what you earn with your job that puts food on the table because that very mechanism around supply and demand is probably going to break down. It's a really interesting, and I'm glad like we're going to unpack this because I've, I've, I've kind of had sections of this conversation with different people as you look into the future. and we are all about maximizing efficiency. And with maximizing efficiency, it takes the human element out because robots are faster. And therefore, if what used to take the job of, let's call it 10 people now takes one, okay, now I can just hire that one person because it's maximizing efficiency. And then what about those other nine? If technologies continue to evolve and evolve and evolve and everything around the other industries are keeping up, then more and more people are going to be without jobs. And it's not because they aren't competent or capable. It's that it's more efficient and cheaper and faster for us to keep using this technology. So it's like, how do they find their new value uh, in society, in the world, uh, be able to provide a means for themselves to keep eating and surviving? Um, and like, I'll, I'll stay there because the next paradigm of it that immediately goes to my brain is that, okay, but we're also with healthcare, people are surviving longer. So if people are staying alive longer, but they don't necessarily have a job to then sustain themselves. Like we get into a really interesting paradigm pretty fast. How do we pay for it? Right. That's always the question. And so we wanted to address that. So I'm glad you raised healthcare because it's one of those areas that you know, we were sort of keenly interested in during the book. And so we came up with a model where we think we could reduce the, co the total cost of the system of healthcare in the United States by 70% by 2040. Right. Um, so this involves a number of key technologies. First of all, the use of artificial intelligence in diagnosis. Um, you know, we're really bad at diagnosing, um, you know, conditions and healthcare issues. Um, in the US, we're about 55, 60% accurate at doing that. So that's why you always ask for a second opinion. You've got about a 60% chance of getting the right diagnos diagnosis. AI is much better at that once trained than humans. Robotic process automation, 40% of healthcare costs in the United States are administrative costs, middlemen dealing with, uh, you know, in the system. So we can eliminate that with uh, robotic process automation. Then you've got gene therapy, which can essentially, you know, eliminate, uh, you know, your diseases from the genome, like fixing a bug in a software program. Um, and then finally, we get to things like personalized medicine, you know, maybe nanobots and stuff like that in the future. We combine all of that and you have a healthcare system. We could deliver universal healthcare to every American at 30% of the cost of the current system. And so why wouldn't you do that? Right. Um, and so that that's a large part of the sort of logic that we use throughout the book is that when we talk about, you know, um, capitalism versus socialism, we often compare the economics of those things and socialism comes out unfavorably. Um, and it's not the workers owning the means of production that we're talking about in the future, but the economy itself serving citizens better. That's our version of, of socialism, where autonomy or autonomous capability leads to government being much smaller and much more efficient from a resource allocation perspective. Um, so that's we can do that in every field. We can do that in education. We can do that in, in um, housing. You know, uh, some, a homeless person on the streets of San Francisco, the policing costs around that is about $35,000 a year. We can build a, uh, we can 3D print a new one bedroom apartment or a small family home for about three or 4,000 US dollars now. So the question is, why would we ever have homelessness? So they're, they're some of the, the technologies we talk about at sort of shifting this paradigm. Yeah, man, there are so many different directions we can go in this conversation. I'm going to start with the first one, which is 
going back to the, the ideal of, of, of healthcare. So I have some background in it and, and, and working with it. And the, there's a reason that it's like, I believe this num- number two GDP in the country. And it's because that's where a lot of the money is flowing into. And it's because of a lot of inefficient processes in place. And it's one of the slowest moving as it becomes into um, technology adjustments and moving with uh, the latest and greatest because systematically it's made to be, I don't say stressful, but it, there's meant to be friction so that people can one, keep their jobs and then two, can continue to justify costs for doing certain things or, you know, even creating a, a brand new drug, right? Like when the, the COVID vaccine, talk about the COVID vaccine uh, and pharmacies making all the money that they're making and like, oh, well, you should share this so that the world can get back to it. And they're like, no, because at the end of the day, they're trying to make as much money as possible. And it's like, that's a tough concept of where do you draw the line between trying to bring capital and make money for your constituents and for your, your stockholders and actually just save, not only say saving the world, but like helping people survive this pandemic, right? Right. So, you know, this is where competition is really critical in terms of really pushing innovation in specific markets. But we don't really, you know, we have a set of monopolies in the United States. We don't have a really free market because those monopolies tend to dominate those industry sectors. And so when you look at, for example, crypto's influence on banking and financial services, or you look at, um, you know, health tech and its impact on the healthcare sector, you have a lot of resistance from the incumbent. These lobbying groups uh, are able to put pressure on lawmakers to slow down, um, you know, regulatory reform around these industries and so forth. So you get lag. So when you look at healthcare, the US pays twice the OECD average for healthcare and often has poorer outcomes, uh, you know, in, in the system. When it comes to banking and finance, if you just look at, say, mobile payments as an example, um, you know, the, the US is probably seven maybe 10 years behind China on that front right now because of those vested interests. And so one of the things we argue quite strongly about is removing vested interests from policymaking in government. Um, you know, and as increasingly as we start to automate government, um, you know, that's possible because we translate it to code. But we don't want the lobbying groups defining how the, that code of the autonomous uh, government should be built either. You know, just a, just a case in point, we just had Scotland, the COP26 gathering. You know, the largest group that was present at, in Scotland for those uh, climate discussions was fossil fuel industry lobbyists. And that's, that's ridiculous that they should be setting the tone of decisions on how we wind off coal, for example, in production of electricity. And it's going to go back to when you're in the process of potentially destroying an industry, they're going to scratch and claw and spin every last dime that they have to survive. Exactly. Um, yeah. And Eek out that last bit of profit, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I genuinely believe that people intrinsically are good and do want to go out for others. But then there becomes a line between like, how do we get to a place where people can make money, people can live comfortably, people can take care of others. But then also with just like the concept of, of, of America's is we're very individualistic, even though we say that, you know, we are about our, our country and the team and every, everything else. And like, we, we will people. go out of our way to we, the people, like we are very individualistic compared to the rest of the world. Like I, okay. now that I've been more exposed to the rest of the world and like ideals, I've come to see that like intrinsically, that's what, that's what we have and are. And I know a lot of eyes typically are on the U.S. on how like we're conducting ourselves and how that translates to the rest of the world. And I think as it relates to where we're heading in the future and, and why I think like this is a very interesting topic with your book is foundationally, we have identified quite a few challenges that the U.S. needs to overcome. Um, and it's how do we start taking those first steps? Again, we have healthcare. Uh, we have um, a problem of, of homelessness is starting to increase. Um, there's a, the new wave of Gen Zers and Gen Xers who may never own property ever. Um, they may be longtime renters. And I know that's also a problem in Australia as well um, because the prices are getting more and more expensive. Hong Kong, the, um, you know, the average home price is 28 times the average annual income. 
Um, that's the least affordable housing in the world in, in Hong Kong. And that's why we saw the umbrella, partially the umbrella protest we saw against uh, the, the Chinese government there. But, you know, in the US, in certain states, um, it's 19 times, you know, average annual income. But if you're working two 30-hour jobs on minimum wage in the United States, there's not a single state where you can afford to rent a one-bedroom home today. Um, and so that disparity between wages and your basic cost of living, like housing, has got to the point where it's no longer functional at an economic level. You know, back in the 1960s, when we had the greatest economic activity the world had seen, where the US counted for 40% of total global output, it was three times average annual salary to buy a home. So that's a very, very different world we live in. And to that extent... Because the other element that I think of as well is when we talk about minimum wages and we talk about cost of living, we also have to throw in the wrench of inflation. So, you know, now we're starting to raise wages uh, to a $15 an hour minimum wage, which then means that, okay, whenever we finally do that, that means we're going to start hiring less people because people aren't going to be able to afford as many people. Going back to the age old question of like, okay, well, we have to be more efficient. We have to do X, Y, Z to automation, yeah. more automation. And then therefore it's going to cause houses to go up even more. So we're just going to keep pushing the, the tracker down the road. And it's just like, at what point do we get to base level? Like where, where is the tipping point before all of this like pops? And like, I don't know if you address that, but like, I also think that in the greater uh, economy and not just the U S but the, but the world, I think we're in a, a bubble. And like, I think there's, there's gotta be a reckoning coming eventually. Well, you know, even money, and its role in society is bound to change. Um, and what we consider assets, you know, we're digitizing the world. So all, all of this is part of this new value system. But the one of the key philosophical changes that we're going to have to make is what's the role of work in our economy? Because as we have highly automated societies, the, the amount of work that you do is going to reduce. In fact, um, you know, since the uh, early 1900s, the number of hours worked in the United States has declined by about 30% over the last uh, 100 years. Um, so naturally, the amount of time we spend in work has is, is already been declined because of productivity gains. But let's say we have 40% youth unemployment in the mid-2030s. This is what we think could happen. We're also going to have labor shortages at the same time because the new jobs that artificial intelligence creates, we're not teaching our children in school to have those skills to take those jobs of the future. The education is mismatched with the, the skills we need. This is where China, frankly, is like whipping our ass right now because they really think about the structure of the economy very differently. But you've got a choice. You know, 40%, 50% youth unemployment in the mid-2030s. Um, your, your choices are you're going to have social uprising. Um, you know, social cohesion is, is going to fail. Uh, much more division than we have today. Or you come up with something like universal basic income to um, be a social safety net. And if you hear Elon Musk, Bill Gates, uh, Steve, you know, Steve Jobs talked about this when he was alive, um, you know, Jeff Bezos talking about this, all of these guys have talked about UBI being fairly inevitable because they understand that the, the drivers of corporate America in terms of corporations is increasingly eliminating human labor from the equation. And at some point, you can't just keep getting rid of human jobs and expect people to just sit there and go, yeah, that's fine. I don't have any food to eat. You know, um, so it means a sort of structural change. So the role of work in, in society is probably going to change from something that we get paid to do to put food on the table to now something that we're passionate about or something that we you know, feel that we, where we can contribute to the greater good. And climate is going to be a very important um, generator of those types of jobs. They're not jobs that capitalism will fund. So for example, building seawall defences around New York City so it doesn't get flooded, making infrastructure, climate resilience. These are things that we would you know, call public works or infrastructure. And someone's going to have to pay for them at some point because flooding you know, half of New York City just because we can't get capitalism to pay for you know, those, those changes in infrastructure, it, the economic costs of that are just you know, unimaginable. So we have to at some point say, the money doesn't really matter. And, and so philosophically, 
we're talking about some pretty deep changes to the way we think about economics and capitalism itself. No doubt. And, you know, one of the things that I do think within like the address as it comes to our infrastructure, I mean, and you brought up New York, when um, the hurricane came up through there and they saw flash flooding and everything else like that, what happens when you have sea levels rise? Like there, there's nothing in place to handle that. And even you look at the, at Texas, when the, when the ice storm happened first time in 40, 50 years and, and unfounded and, and there's nothing we can do about it because they had, uh, it, it exposed all these and and like even the pandemic challenges. exposed the same. Like our ability to respond to the coronavirus, you know, to have enough ICU beds with ventilators was a challenge. We and and cap, you just can't turn that stuff on in a, in an instant, you know. And so, if you're looking at energy grid capacity, if you're looking at, at preventing sea level rise, these are, you know, um, things you have to think very differently about um, solving rather than just letting the free market get to it. You know, there is certain elements, you know, that we need to think about for for the collective good. So this is sort of the realignment we think that economies will have, both as a result of AI and um, and climate uh, over, you know, sort of the latter part of this, this first half of the century. So I just want to spend a couple more moments on universal basic income, because obviously a lot of people push back on that pretty hard. Um, how do you think that's going to pan out? Like, how do you see, like, when we get to the point where that becomes a thing like why would for some people be incentivized to try to do any work at all yeah you know there, we examined 72 ubi trials globally in the book and um, what's interesting is that um as a you know at versus a sample of the population in normal um you know economics versus those that receive ubi and the ubi rate varied from like $300 a month to like $2500 a month but for example um more people created businesses when they received ubi than in the standard sample uh, of the population um more people got involved in community related uh, you know causes and things like that because they didn't any longer have the the time or the pressure to to you know put food on the table, so the the assumption that if you give people UBI they won't work has not actually been borne out by the these trials that we've seen, but we also talk about in the book how we might pay for it, and so you know one arena that's been suggested is that if a corporation gets rid of a human and replaces them with an algorithm or a robot that that should be taxed and that that tax would provide some support for UBI. Um, the other thing we talk about is maybe creating central bank digital currencies as an additional monetary supply. So you could create a CBDC that funds UBI and you use that uh, for purchase of, of goods and staples you know, that you need to live as an example. Um, the wealth that AI generates is another clear um, you know, pool of uh, capital that we could use to fund UBI. But one sort of radical suggestion we propose in the book is forgiveness of national debt. And we propose that um, all national debt is forgiven, but put into a pool that's committed towards these climate mitigation programs and so forth. And that to qualify for UBI, you have to do a couple of years of national service on this sort of climate mitigation program. And that then qualifies you for UBI later on. So we get into this in quite some detail in the book. It's very interesting. Um, and I, you know, I like the concept of once you have more freedom, people are able to start working on more things that they're passionate about, starting their own business and do whatever. I think intrinsically, people get bored. And if you just told somebody like, oh yeah, just sit here and do nothing all day. Like, yeah, you might do that for a while, but you're eventually going to want to do something just because and we we like activity. We like these things. But the, we the question- the I, Yeah, yeah we, we need the purpose. But you, you brought up CBDC, centralized uh, banking digital currencies um, and um, central banking digital currencies. And- I want to tie it back to crypto just real quick. Where do you see crypto's role as we head into this future? So part of what we're also seeing right now is that corporations are coming increasingly under pressure on things like uh, ESG um, and you know being good corporate citizens. So that's why you see brands like Apple and Google and others talking about carbon neutrality and using sustainable um, you know goods in their uh, products and so forth. And that's because people are now starting to take notice about whether these corporate corporations or brands are good corporate citizens. Um, and so we do expect some sort of pressure to come on this system in respect to, to some of those things and giving more visibility to, you know, um, what's the purpose 
of your your corporation? What is its contribution to society more more broadly, rather than just the products you produce? Um, and so, I do see that cryptocurrencies could be emerge around these value systems. For example, you know, carbon carbon neutral coins or um, you know, sustainable coins and things like that, where people start using these cryptocurrencies because their be belief set aligns with the core utility that this cryptocurrency uh, provides, as an example. Um, and obviously, CBDCs are already a response to the emergence of cryptocurrencies. But the whole digitization of money is, is largely happening because commerce itself is digitizing. It's becoming global. It's becoming real time. And so fiat currencies don't make a lot of sense in that environment. We need something that is more virtual. So that's part of the, the sort of pressure mechanism that's coming. But China's one to watch here. Obviously, the E1 um, is uh, fairly advanced in respect to the trials. It's being uh, deployed in like a dozen cities now. Um, they're going to be using CBDC e-wallets for um, the, the uh, Beijing elite Olympics next year, um, and they're probably going to pin trading activity on the Belt and Road Initiative to the cryptocurrency as well as an effort to sort of displace or reduce the power of the petrodollar. So uh, ultimately, I think um, you know, we're on a trajectory here where digital currencies, both crypto and you know, central bank digital currencies, are going to be a very big part of the 21st century economy. No doubt. And uh, crypto and digital currencies here to stay, just like you said, we're in, a, we're in a global economy and fiat doesn't make a ton of sense. I mean, I personally don't really care around cash. I don't know a lot of people that do. A lot of them's on cards, cash, or even just being able to pay from your phone, right? It's everything, like how much cash you actually touch on a regular basis now doesn't really happen. So um, it just it just makes logical sense. Um, but I think another piece of it, just like you said, governments are going to have to start looking at ways that they can stay up to date with what's going on because crypto's here to stay and they have to be in, get in to front adapt. of it. Yeah. yeah. No doubt, and man. That, that resistance that we've seen to to crypto in um, you know certain economies, um, you know, obviously, like the the decision in China um, around you know banning um, crypto was probably more about energy and their view that their CBDC should be the dominant currency than it was actually that they've got anything structurally opposed to crypto. Um, uh, but in the US, you know, we, we've sort of lagged. We, we're pretty good on regulation supporting crypto and SEC and so forth. That's sort of evolved, um, you know, there. But, um, you know, the, the understanding of where crypto might fit in society and the concept of a wallet and how wallets are going to replace bank accounts, um, you know, and smart wallets are going to help you manage your money. Um, that is yet, we're, we're not seeing the sort of recognition of that in, in the US regulatory system, at least. Yeah. And there will be a reckoning at some point where a lot of these crypto com companies, uh, right now we're just, a lot of the world is trying to see how is it going to be regulated ultimately. Uh, and once the parameters are truly put in place, we're going to see this dynamic shift as it relates to crypto, where right now it's not super sexy and reliable for uh, these huge hedge fund managers and and um, CFOs to have diversification into crypto, but then eventually they'll turn a page and like it's like, oh, you don't, you're not exposed. What are you doing? And once that, once that page is turned, we're gonna see crypto take off in a whole other direction that I'm pretty excited and pumped for. I, I would think it's inevitable, but that's conversation no, no, for I think another we day. Agree with you on that front. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man. And honestly, like this has been a super really, really amazing conversation. And there's so much to unpack with it. And I think a great way to do that would be able to get your book. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how people can find out more? It's called The Rise of Techno-Socialism, How Inequality, AI, and Climate Will Usher in a New World. It's available, of course, on Amazon. But if you want to find out, a, a, you know, on Barnes & Noble and so forth, if you want to find, a, find out a little bit more information about the book, you can go to riseoftechnosocialism.com or technosocialism.com. And, you know, we've got a, a video trailer there for the book on promotion. And we've got various sections of the book. You can download the first chapter for free and check it out. And if you buy five copies, Copies of the book and show us your proof of purchase, you'll get an NFT. That's cool. That's pretty awesome, man. 
Well, I think that's a great way to do it. As we wrap up here, Mel, I always like to finish with a couple of fun questions. And the one that I want to bring to you, you've written six books at this point. You've been in this industry for a long time. What are one to two pieces of wisdom you would give yourself when you first started this journey? Well, um, buy Bitcoin and Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, and hold. <laughs> um, yeah, and hold. Um, no, I, I think, um, you know, I've had an extraordinary career, actually. I've been very blessed. and um, But I, I think... Uh, the advice I would give to my younger self is is don't be afraid to just experiment and get out there and give it a shot because, you know, it was when I was more conservative and less, uh, you know, more risk adverse uh, that I tended to sort of be back into sort of a dead end, you know, stream. But um, when I when I've let myself out there and taken on risk, and it's not always worked. Um, but the uh, the more risk I've allowed myself to expose to, and the more learning I've done, um, the more personal advancement I've uh, enjoyed. So um, if if I can I'd take something away from it, it's like go for it. Absolutely, no, that's an, that's a gem of a thought. Thank you for sharing it. And as we wrap up here, man, what is a final thought that you want to leave with all the listeners here today? I, if you want to take one thing away from this conversation, there's a lot of talk about economics and politics, and you know. Uh, organizing principles for society. But the one thing that I've learned through all this research, one is technology's advancement is inevitable. But when it comes to the future of the human species, our optimal form of humanity, the very best that we can be as a species and therefore individually is when we walk, work together with purpose. And so that's the one thing that I think humanity must really embrace in the future. Great final thought. Work with each other with purpose. And again, don't be afraid to take some risk and especially bet on yourself because it allows a lot more opportunities to head your way. Brett, thank you so much for all the information, everything that you dropped us on today. This was an extremely great conversation. Hopefully I can bring you on for a part two just because there's so much more to unpack. I'm sure after I read this book um, and we will uh, definitely stay in touch with that. But again, one more time, what are ways that uh, people can learn more about your book? So you can go to my website, brettking.com or technosocialism.com, Rise of Technosocialism, or just search Technosocialism on Google and you'll get the link to the book. So um, yeah, um, I, please everyone go and order it. We're trying for the New York Times and you know we, we hope to get there over the next few days. Uh, any, any of your orders will help. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Brett. And of course, for everyone listening, stay cryptocurrent.